native americans by bob brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. american cheddars the first american cheddar was made soon after sixteen twenty around plymouth by pilgrim fathers who brought along not only cheese from the homeland but a live cow to continue the supply proof of our ability to manufacture cheddar of our own lies in the fact that by seventeen ninety we were exporting it back to england it was called cheddar after the english original named for the village of cheddar near bristol more than a century ago it made a new name for itself herkimer county cheese from the section of new york state where it was first made best herkimer still equals its several distinguished competitors coon colorado blackie california jack pineapple sage vermont colby and wisconsin longhorn the english call our imitation yankee or american cheddar while here at home it was popularly known as yellow or store cheese from its prominent position in every country store also apple pie cheese because of its affinity for the all-american dessert the first cheddar factory was founded by jesse williams in rome new york just over a century ago and with herkimer county cheddar already widely known this established new york as the preferred store-bought in cheese an account of new york's cheese business in the pioneer wooden nutmeg era is found in ernest elmo calkins interesting book they broke the prairies a yankee named sylvanus ferris the most successful dairyman of herkimer county in the first decades of the eighteen hundreds teamed up with robert nesbitt the old quaker cheese buyer they bought from farmers in the region and sold in new york city and according to the business ethics of the times nesbitt went ahead to cheapen the cheese offered by deprecating its quality hinting at a bad market and departing without buying later when ferris arrived in a more optimistic mood offering a slightly better price the seller unaware they were partners and ignorant of the market price snapped up the offer similar sharp trade tactics put too much green cheese on the market so those honestly aged from a minimum of eight months up to two years fetched higher prices they were called old such as old herkimer old wisconsin longhorn and old california jack although the established cheddar ages are three fresh medium cured and cured or aged commercially they are divided into two and described as mild and sharp the most popular are named for their states colorado illinois kentucky new york ohio vermont and wisconsin two new york staters are called and named separately coon and herkimer county tillamook goes by its own name with no mention of oregon pineapple monterey jack and sage are seldom listed as cheddars at all although they are basically that brick brick is the one and only cheese for which the whole world gives america credit runners-up are liederkranz which rivals say is too close to limburger and pineapple which is only a cheddar under its criss-crossed painted and flavored rind yet brick is no more distinguished than either of the hundred percent americans and in our opinion is less worth bragging about it is a medium firm mild to strong slicing cheese for sandwiches and melting in hot dishes its texture is elastic but not rubbery its taste sweetish and it is full of little round holes or eyes all this has inspired enthusiasts to liken it to emmentaler the most appropriate name for it has long been married man's limburger to make up for the mildness caraway seed is sometimes added about civil war time john jossie a dairyman of dodge county wisconsin came up with this novelty a rennet cheese made of whole cow's milk the curd is cut like cheddar heated stirred and cooked firm to put in a brick-shaped box without a bottom and with slits in the sides to drain when this is set on the draining table a couple of bricks are also laid on the cooked curd for pressure it is this double use of bricks for shaping and for pressing that has led to the confusion about which came first 
in originating the name the formed bricks of cheese are rubbed with salt for three days and they ripen slowly taking up to two months we eat several million pounds a year and ninety five per cent of that comes from wisconsin with a trickle from new york colorado blackie cheese a subtly different american cheddar is putting colorado on our cheese map it is called blackie from the black waxed rind and it resembles vermont state cheese although it is flatter this is a proud new american product proving that although papa cheddar was born in england his american kinfolk have developed independent and valuable characters all on their own coon cheese coon cheese is full of flavor from being aged on shelves at a higher temperature than cold storage its rind is darker from the growth of mold and this shade is sometimes painted on more ordinary cheddars to make them look like coon which always brings a ten per cent premium above the general run made at lowville new york it has received high praise from a host of admirers among them the french cook clementine in phineas beck's kitchen who raised it to the par of french immortals by calling it fromage de coon clementine used it with scintillating success in countless french recipes which ended with the words gratiné au four et servir très chaud she made baguettes of it by soaking sticks three eighths inch square and one and a half inches long in lukewarm milk rolling them in flour beaten egg and bread crumbs and browning them instantaneously in boiling oil herkimer county cheese the standard method for making american cheddar was established in herkimer county new york in eighteen forty one and has been rigidly maintained down to this day made with rennet and a bacterial starter the curd is cut and pressed to squeeze out all of the whey and then aged in cylindrical forms for a year or more herkimer leads the whole breed by being flaky brittle sharp and nutty with a crumb that will crumble and a soft mouth-watering pale orange color when it is properly aged isigny isigny is a native american cheese that came a cropper it seems to be extinct now and perhaps that is all to the good for it never meant to be anything more than another camembert of which we have plenty of imitation not long after the civil war the attempt was made to perfect isigny the curd was carefully prepared according to an original formula washed and rubbed and set aside to come of age but when it did alas it was more like limburger than camembert and since good domestic limburger was then a dime a pound obviously it wouldn't pay off yet in shape of the newborn resembled camembert although it was much larger so they cut it down and named it after the delicate french creme de signy jack california jack and monterey jack jack was first known as monterey cheese from the california county where it originated then it was called jack for short and only now takes its full name after sixty years of popularity on the west coast because it is little known in the east and has to be shipped so far it commands the top cheddar price monterey jack is a stirred curd cheddar without any annatto coloring it is sweeter than most and milder when young but it gets sharper with age and more expensive because of storage costs leader crans no native american cheese has been so widely ballyhooed and so deservedly as leader crans which translates wreath of song back in the gay inventive nineties emil frey a young delicatessen keeper in new york tried to please some bereft customers by making an imitation of bismarck schloss casa this was imperative because the imported german cheese didn't stand up during the long sea trip and emil's customers mostly members of the famous liederkranz singing society didn't feel like singing without it but emil's attempts at imitation only added indigestion to their dejection until one day fabelhaft one of those cheese dream castles in spain came true he turned out a tawny altogether golden tangy and mellow little marvel that actually was an improvement on bismarck's old schloss casa 
better than brick it was a deodorized limburger both a man's cheese and one that cheese conscious women adored emil named it wreath of song for the leader crayon's customers it soon became as internationally known as tabasco from texas or parisian camembert which it slightly resembles borden's bought out fry in nineteen twenty nine and they enjoy telling the story of a g i who to celebrate v e day in paris sent to his family in indiana only a few miles from the factory at van wert ohio a whole case of what he had learned was the finest cheese france could make and when the family opened it there was liederkranz another deserved distinction is that of being sandwiched in between two foreign immortals in the following recipe schnitzel bank pot one ripe camembert cheese one liederkranz one eighth pound imported roquefort one quarter pound butter one tablespoon flour one cup cream one half cup finely chopped olives one quarter cup canned pimento a sprinkling of cayenne depending on whether or not you like the edible rind of camembert and liederkranz you can leave it on scrape any thick part off or remove it all mash the soft creams together with the roquefort butter and flour using a silver fork put the mix into an enameled pan for anything with a metal surface will turn the cheese black in cooking stir in the cream and keep stirring until you have a smooth creamy sauce strain through sieve or cheesecloth and mix in the olives and pimento thoroughly sprinkle well with cayenne and put into a pot to mellow for a few days or much longer the name schnitzelbank comes from school bench a game this snappy sweet pot is specially suited to a beer party and stein songs it is also the affinity spread with rye and pumpernickel and may be served in small sandwiches or on crackers celery and such to make appetizing tidbits for cocktails tea or cider like the trinity of cheeses that make it the mixture is eaten best at room temperature when its flavor is fullest if kept in the refrigerator it should be taken out a couple of hours before serving since it is a natural cheese mixture which has gone through no process or doping with preservative it will not keep more than two weeks this mellow sharp mix is the sort of ideal the factory processors shoot at with their olive pimento abominations once you've potted your own you'll find it gives the same thrill as garnishing your own lip tower minnesota blue the discovery of sandstone caves in the bluffs along the mississippi in and near the twin cities of minnesota has established a distinctive type of blue cheese named for the state although the roquefort process of france is followed and the cheese is inoculated in the same way by mould from bread it can never equal the genuine imported marked with its red sheep brand because the milk used in minnesota blue is cow's milk and the caves are sandstone instead of limestone yet this is an excellent blue cheese in its own right pineapple pineapple cheese is named after its shape rather than its flavor although there are rumors that some pineapple flavor is noticeable near the oiled rind this flavor does not penetrate through to the cheddar center many makers of processed cheese have tampered with the original so today you can't be sure of anything except getting a smaller size every year or two at a higher price originally six pounds the pineapple has shrunk to nearly six ounces the proper bright orange oiled and shellacked surface is more apt to be a sickly lemon always an ornamental cheese it once stood in state on the sideboard under a silver bell also made to represent a pineapple you cut a top slice off the cheese just as you would off the fruit and there was a rose-colored fine tasting mellow hard cheese to spoon out with a special silver cheese spoon or scoop between meals the silver top was put on the silver holder and the oiled and shellacked rind kept the cheese moist even when the pineapple was eaten down to the rind the shell served as a dunking bowl to fill with some salubrious cold fondue or salad made in the same manner as cheddar with the curd cooked harder pineapple's distinction lies in being hung in a net 
that makes diamond-shaped corrugations on the surface simulating the sections of the fruit it is a pioneer american product with almost a century and a half of service since lewis m norton conceived it in eighteen hundred eight in litchfield county connecticut there in eighteen forty five he built a factory and made a deserved fortune out of his decorative ingenuity with what before had been plain unromantic yellow or store cheese perhaps his inspiration came from cone-shaped cheshire in old england also called pineapple cheese combined with the hanging up of provolones in italy that leaves the looser pattern of the four sustaining strings sage vermont sage and vermont state the story of sage cheese or green cheese as it was called originally shows the several phases most cheeses have gone through from their simple honest beginnings to commercialization and sometimes back to the real thing the english encyclopedia of practical cookery has an early sage recipe this is a species of cream cheese made by adding sage leaves and greening to the milk a very good receipt for it is given thus bruise the tops of fresh young red sage leaves with an equal quantity of spinach leaves and squeeze out the juice add this to the extract of rennet and stir into the milk as much as your taste may deem sufficient break the curd when it comes salt it fill the vat high with it press for a few hours and then turn the cheese every day fancy cheese in america lay charles a Publo records the commercialization of the cheese mentioned above a century or two later in nineteen ten sage cheese is another modified form of the cheddar variety its distinguishing features are a mottled green color and a sage flavor the usual method of manufacture is as follows one-third of the total amount of milk is placed in a vat by itself and colored green by the addition of eight to twelve ounces of commercial sage color to each one thousand pounds of milk if green corn leaves unavailable in england or other substances are used for coloring the amounts will vary accordingly the milk is then made up by the regular cheddar method as is also the remaining two-thirds in a separate vat at the time of removing the whey the green and white curds are mixed some prefer however to mix the curds at the time of milling as a more distinct color is secured after milling the sage extract flavoring is sprayed over the curd with an atomizer the curd is then salted and pressed into the regular cheddar shapes and sizes a very satisfactory sage cheese is made at the new york state college of agriculture by simply dropping green coloring made from the leaves of corn and spinach upon the curd after milling an even green modeling is thus easily secured without additional labor sage flavoring extract is sprayed over the curd by an atomizer one half ounce of flavoring is usually sufficient for a hundred pounds of curd and can be secured from dairy supply houses a modern cheese authority reported on the current nineteen fifty three method instead of sage leaves or tea prepared from them at present the cheese is flavored with oil of dalmatian wild sage because it has the sharpest flavor this piney oil thujone is diluted with water two hundred fifty parts to one and either added to the milk or sprayed over the curds one eighth ounce for five hundred quarts of milk in scouting around for a possible maker of the real thing today we wrote to vrest orton of vermont and got this reply sage cheese is one of the really indigenous and best native vermont products so far as i know there is only one factory making it and that is my friend george crowley's he makes a limited amount for my vermont country store it is the fine old-time full cream cheese flavored with real sage on this hangs a tale some years ago i couldn't get enough sage cheese we never can so i asked a wisconsin cheese maker if he would make some said he would but couldn't at that time because the alfalfa wasn't ripe i said what in hell has alfalfa got to do with sage cheese he said well we flavor the sage cheese with a synthetic sage flavor 
and then throw in some pieces of chopped up alfalfa to make it look green so i said to hell with that and the next time i saw george crowley i told him the story and george said we don't use synthetic flavor alfalfa or anything like that then what do you use george i inquired we use real sage why well because it's cheaper than that synthetic stuff the genuine vermont sage arrived here are our notes on it oh wilderness were paradise enow my taste buds come to full flower with the sage there's a slight burned savor recalling smoked cheese although not related in any way mildly resinous like that near east one packed in pine suggesting the well sage dressing of a turkey a round mouthful of luscious mellowness with a bouquet a snapping reminder to the nose and there's just a soupçon of new-mown hay above the green freckles of herb to delight the eye and set the fancy free so this is the veritable vert green cheese the moon is made of it vert veritable a general favor with everybody who ever tasted it for generations of lusty crumblers old-fashioned vermont state store cheese we received from savant brest orden another letter together with some vermont store cheese and some crackers this cheese is our regular old-fashioned store cheese it's been in old country stores for generations and we have been pioneers in spreading the word about it it is of course a natural aged cheese no processing no fussing no fooling with it it's made the same way it was back in eighteen seventy by the old-time colby method which makes a cheese which is not so dry as cheddar and also has holes in it something like swiss also it ages faster did you know that during the last part of the nineteenth century and part of the twentieth vermont was the leading cheese-making state in the union when i was a lad every town in vermont had one or more cheese factories now there are only two left not counting any that make process process isn't cheese the crackers are the old-time store cracker every vermonter used to buy a big barrel once a year to set in the buttery and eat the classic dish is crackers broken up in a bowl of cold milk with a hunk of cheddar cheese like this on the side grand snack grand midnight supper grand anything these crackers are not sweet not salt and as such make a good base for anything swell with clam chowder also with toasted cheese tillamook it takes two pocket-sized but thick yellow volumes to record the story of oregon's great tillamook the cheddar box by dean collins comes neatly bound and boxed in golden cloth stamped with a purple title like the rind of a real tillamook volume one is entitled cheese cheddar and volume two is a two-pound cheddar cheese labeled tillamook and molded to fit inside its book jacket we borrowed volume one from a noted litterateur and never could get him to come across with volume two we guessed its fate however from a note on the fly-leaf of the only tome available this is an excellent cheese full cream and medium sharp and a unique set of books in which volume two suggests bacon's some books are to be tasted others to be swallowed and some few to be chewed and digested wisconsin longhorn since we began this chapter with all american cheddars it is only fitting to end with wisconsin longhorn a sort of national standard even though it's not nearly so fancy or high-priced as some of the regional natives that can't approach its enormous output it's one of those all-purpose round cheeses that even taste round in your mouth we are specially partial to it most cheddars are named after their states yet putting all of these thirty-seven states together they produce only about half as much as wisconsin alone besides longhorn in wisconsin there are a dozen regional competitors ranging from white twin cheddar to which no annatto coloring has been added through green bay cheese to wisconsin redskin and martha washington aged proudly set forth by p h casper of bear creek who is said to have won more prizes in forty years than any ten cheesemakers put together to help guarantee a market for all this excellent apple pie cheese the wisconsin state legislature 
made a law about it recognizing the truth of eugene field's jingle apple pie without cheese is like a kiss without a squeeze small matter in the badger state when the affinity is made legal and the couple lawfully wedded in statute number one hundred sixty thousand zero sixty five it's still in force butter and cheese to be served every person firm or corporation duly licensed to operate a hotel or restaurant shall serve with each meal for which a charge of twenty five cents or more is made at least two-thirds of an ounce of wisconsin butter and two-thirds of an ounce of wisconsin cheese besides longhorn wisconsin leads in limburger it produces so much swiss that the state is sometimes called swissconsin end of native americans by bob brown read by betty b pablo picasso by marius de Zayas, from the april july issue of camera work 1911 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org pablo picasso let me say at the beginning that i do not believe in art criticism and the more especially when it is concerned with painting i grant that everyone has the right to express their opinion in art matters to applaud or disapprove according to their own personal way of seeing and feeling but i hold that they should do so without assuming any authority and without pretending to possess the absolute truth or even a relative one and also that they should not base their judgments on established rules upon the pretense that they are consecrated by use and by the criterion of high authority between a civil or a penal judge and a critic there is a great difference the judge judges according to the law but does not make the law he has to submit himself to the letter and the spirit of the law though it might conflict with his personal opinions because that law is an absolute rule of conduct dictated by society to which all have to submit but art is free it has never had it has not and will never have a legislature in spite of the academies and every artist has the right to interpret nature as he pleases or as he can leaving to the public the liberty to applaud or condemn theoretically every critic is a priest of a dogma of a system and condemns implacably what he finds to be out of his faith a faith not reasoned but imposed he never stops to consider the personality of the artist whose work he is judging to investigate what his tendencies are what his purpose is or what efforts he made to attain his object and to what point he has realized his program i have devoted my life to the study of art principally painting and sculpture i believe i have seen all that is worth seeing and i have never dared pass sentence on a work declaring it good even if signed by the most renowned artist nor declare it bad though it bears the name of a person totally unknown at the most i dare say that it pleases or displeases me and to express the personal motives of my impressions scholastic criticism has never profited any one on the contrary it has always restrained the spirit of a creator it has always discouraged humiliated and killed those who have had the weakness to take it into consideration each epoch has had its artists and must have its art as each also has its men of science and its science and anyone who intends to oppose a dyke to the flood tide of human genius is perverse or a fool this love for the dogma the tendency of the academy to enchain to suffocate 
and to vilify has greatly damaged the countries in which it has prevailed this has been the cause of delay in the progress of art in spain and on account of this system we see the spanish artists those of personal inspiration and haughty spirit perish there or emigrate to paris looking for a better atmosphere for though it is true that there is in paris also an academic sect that suffocates one which proclaims that outside of itself there is no salvation nevertheless art has succeeded in conquering an independence which permits all sorts of attempts at new expression art has not died in spain or not at least among spaniards what is beginning to die is the old tradition or rather the intransigent traditionalism and the best proof of it is the notable number of spanish painters living in paris who prosper there gaining enviable fame and who at the end will figure among the french glories instead of adding illustrious names to the already extensive spanish catalogue i intend to make these artists known to the american world describing the work of each one of them not as i see feel and understand it but as each one of them has conceived it i want to tell at present of pablo picasso from malaga who finds himself in the first rank among the innovators a man who knows what he wants and wants what he knows who has broken with all school prejudices has opened for himself a wide path and has already acquired that notoriety which is the first step towards glory i do not know if he is known in spain and if he is whether they appreciate his efforts and study his works what i know is that he is a parisian personality which constitutes a glorious achievement i have studied picasso both the artist and his work which was not difficult for he is a sincere and spontaneous man who makes no mystery of his ideals nor the method he employs to realize them picasso tries to produce with his work an impression not with the subject but the manner in which he expresses it he receives a direct impression from external nature he analyzes develops and translates it and afterwards executes it in his own particular style with the intention that the picture should be the pictorial equivalent of the emotion produced by nature in presenting his work he wants the spectator to look for the emotion or idea generated from the spectacle and not the spectacle itself from this to the psychology of form there is but one step and the artist has given it resolutely and deliberately instead of the physical manifestation he seeks in form the psychic one and on account of his peculiar temperament his physical manifestations inspire him with geometrical sensations when he paints he does not limit himself to taking from an object only those planes which the eye perceives but deals with all those which according to him constitute the individuality of form and with his peculiar fantasy he develops and transforms them and this suggests to him new impressions which he manifests with new forms because from the idea of the representation of a being a new being is born perhaps different from the first one and this becomes the represented being each one of his paintings is the coefficient of the impressions that form has performed in his spirit and in these paintings the public must see the realization of an artistic ideal and must judge them by the abstract sensation they produce without trying to look for the factors that entered into the composition of the final result as it is not his purpose to perpetuate on the canvas 
an aspect of external nature by which to produce an artistic impression but to represent with the brush the impression he has directly received from nature synthesized by his fantasy he does not put on the canvas the remembrance of a past sensation but describes a present sensation picasso has a different conception of perspective from that in use by the traditionalists according to his way of thinking and painting form must be represented in its intrinsic value and not in relation to other objects he does not think it right to paint a child in size far larger than that of a man just because the child is in the foreground and one wants to indicate that the man is some distance away from it the painting of distance to which the academic school subordinates everything seems to him an element which might be of great importance in a topographical plan or in a geographical map but false and useless in a work of art in his paintings perspective does not exist in them there is nothing but harmonies suggested by form and registers which succeed themselves to compose a general harmony which fills the rectangle that constitutes the picture following the same philosophical system in dealing with light as the one he follows in regard to form to him color does not exist but only the effects of light this produces in matter certain vibrations which produce in the individual certain impressions from this it results that picasso's painting presents to us the evolution by which light and form have operated in developing themselves in his brain to produce the idea and his composition is nothing but the synthetic expression of his emotions those who have studied egyptian art without greco-roman prejudices know that the sons of the nile and the desert sought in their works the realization of an ideal conceived by meditation before the mysterious river and by ecstasy before the imposing solitude and that is why they transformed matter into form and gave to substance the reflection of that which exists only in essence something of this sort happens in picasso's work which is the artistic representation of a psychology of form in which he tries to represent in essence what seems to exist only in substance and likewise just as when we contemplate part of a gothic cathedral we feel an abstract sensation produced by an ensemble of geometrical figures whose significance we do not perceive and whose real form we do not understand immediately so the paintings of picasso have the tendency to produce a similar effect they compel the spectator to forget the beings and objects which are the base of the picture and whose representation is the highest state to which his fantasy has been able to carry them through a geometrical evolution according to his judgment all the races as represented in their artistic exponents have tried to represent form through a fantastic aspect modifying it to adapt it to the idea they wanted to express and at the bottom all of them have pursued the same artistic ideal with a tendency similar to his own technique marius de Zayas. End of Pablo Picasso by Marius de Zayas from the April-July issue of Camera Work, 1911. Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Voyager 1 Encounters Saturn by National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrari. Voyager 1 Encounters Saturn by National Aeronautics and Space Administration. 
forward the pictures assembled in this publication are a part of the rich and varied harvest of information returned by voyager one across nearly a billion miles of interplanetary space these images are of great beauty as well as great scientific interest serving to remind us of the awesome and breathtaking dimensions of the solar system we inhabit voyager is providing intriguing new information which should help us to understand how the earth and possibly the universe was formed already there have been surprises and puzzles that paint a completely new picture of saturn and its neighborhood including the discovery of three new moons startling information about saturn's rings and observation of the unexpectedly complex structure of saturn's atmosphere and that of its largest moon titan it will take years for scientists to assimilate completely the information which is cascading down from voyager what more will this marvel of technology have to tell us before it departs the solar system to travel endlessly among the stars robert a frosch administrator national aeronautics and space administration december nineteen eighty the date of each photograph and the distance of the spacecraft from the planet or satellite are included with each picture for sale by the superintendent of documents u s government printing office washington d c two zero four o two stock number zero three three dash zero 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 dash zero zero eight one seven dash one illustration voyager one was launched from cape canaveral florida on september fifth nineteen seventy seven beginning its journey to jupiter saturn and beyond introduction no other generation has had the opportunity or the technology to reach beyond our world to see to touch to hear the forces that shape our universe in slightly over two decades man has ingeniously explored five distant planets and two dozen moons we have seen their weather and surfaces landed on some probed the atmosphere of others and listened to their radio noises under the planetary exploration program of the national aeronautics and space administration the voyager mission begun in nineteen seventy two was designed to explore jupiter saturn their satellites rings magnetic fields and interplanetary space two automated reprogrammable spacecraft voyagers one and two were launched in late summer of nineteen seventy seven their goals the outer planets both spacecraft made astounding discoveries in the jupiter system in nineteen seventy nine a thin ring a thick ionized sulphur and oxygen torus an actively volcanic satellite these were but a few of the treasures yielded by the two jupiter flybys now voyager one has completed exploration of its final target the ringed planet saturn and its enigmatic giant satellite titan true to the generally unpredictable nature of planetary exploration the treasures of the saturn system far exceeded all expectations we learned more about saturn in one week than in all of recorded history thanks to one trusty robot no larger than a compact car and to thousands of diligent and imaginative people both spacecraft carry an assortment of optical radiometric and fields and particle sensing instruments taken together their data present a comprehensive picture of a planetary system and clues to what is happening what has happened and what may happen in our universe this publication presents the preliminary photographic results of voyager one's encounter with saturn and its major satellites voyager one transmitted over seventeen thousand five hundred images in its four months of close observations of the system many of these images have been combined to produce mosaics and color pictures hundreds have yet to be closely examined the second voyager spacecraft will begin its close saturn observations in early june nineteen eighty one and make its closest approach to the planet's northern hemisphere on august twenty fifth 
then due to its launch during a period of rare planetary alignment occurring only once every one hundred and seventy five years voyager two will be able to continue on to a rendezvous with the seventh planet uranus in january nineteen eighty six and perhaps even the eighth planet neptune in august nineteen eighty nine voyager one's primary mission is complete but its usefulness is far from over as we go about our daily business voyager one is searching for another frontier the edge of our solar system in seven to fifteen years the spacecraft will cross the heliopause the farthest reaches of our sun's magnetic field influence then high above our ecliptic plane voyager one will continue its flight toward the star alpha ophiuchus eventually voyager one will be too distant to communicate with earth and will silently drift in space forever andrew j stofan acting associate administrator for space science national aeronautics and space administration the planet illustration eleven five a nine million kilometers five point five million miles saturn is the sixth planet from the sun and second largest in our solar system like jupiter it is a giant sphere of gas mostly hydrogen and helium with a possible core of rocky material various features in saturn's cloud tops are visible in the accompanying color enhanced image of the planet's northern hemisphere small-scale convective cloud features similar to but much larger than thunderstorms in earth's atmosphere are visible in the brown belt an isolated convective cloud with a dark ring is visible in the light brown zone and a longitudinal wave is visible in the light blue region illustration nine seventeen eighty seventy six million kilometers forty seven million miles as voyager one approached saturn a series of dark and light cloud bands belts and zones became apparent in the planet's northern hemisphere through a high altitude atmospheric haze the planet's shadow obscures the rings behind and immediately to the east of the disk in addition the shadow of the rings on the planet's disk can be seen just north of the rings themselves as they cross in front of the planet six of saturn's fifteen known satellites are visible saturn's largest moon titan considerably larger than earth's moon is clearly visible in the upper left corner the smaller satellites dion tethys and rhea are shown in the lower left corner upper middle and lower respectively two of the innermost moons mimas and enceladus appear to the right of the planet mimas is the one closer to the planet these six moons orbit saturn in the equatorial plane and appear in their present positions because voyager is above that plane illustration ten eighteen eighty thirty four million kilometers twenty one million miles the north temperate belt is visible as the violet colored belt in this false color photograph in this image features which are especially bright in ultraviolet light appear as turquoise and violet while ultraviolet dark areas appear orange notice in particular the three spots two bright orange and one pale violet at mid-northern latitudes the bright spots are similar to those shown at much higher resolution in later images the distinct color difference between the north equatorial belt and saturn's other belts and zones may be due to a thick haze layer covering the northern portion of the belt it is not yet understood why the southern hemisphere of the planet below the rings appears bluer than the northern hemisphere color spots in the rings are artifacts of image processing illustration ten thirty eighty eighteen million kilometers eleven million miles saturn's soft velvety appearance and previously unseen detail in its mysterious rings 
became visible as voyager one approached the planet for example a gap in the dark sea ring is now visible and material can be seen within the relatively wide cassini division long believed to be empty which separates the b ring middle from the a ring outer the egg division appears near the outer edge of the a ring detail can be seen within the shadow cast by the rings upon the planet the broad dark band near the equator is the shadow of the b ring the thinner brighter line just to the south is the shadow of the less dense a ring three of saturn's moons tethys outer left enceladus inner left and mimus right are also visible in this computer mosaic of voyager one images illustration eleven six eighty eight point five million kilometers five point three million miles an unusual red oval cloud feature similar to but smaller than jupiter's great red spot was discovered in the southern hemisphere of saturn the oval six thousand kilometers four thousand miles in length is located at fifty five degrees south latitude the difference in color between the red oval and the surrounding bluish clouds in these two false color images indicates that material within the oval contains a substance that absorbs more blue and violet light than the bluish clouds voyager scientists first observed the oval in august nineteen eighty and the feature has retained its appearance since its discovery illustration eleven six eighty eight million kilometers five million miles in this photograph the shadow of the satellite diom is seen as a dark circle on the face of the planet illustration eleven ten eighty three point five million kilometers two point two million miles a ribbon-like wave structure and small convective features marking a westward jet stream above the wave are visible in this photograph of saturn's cloud tops the view extending from forty degrees to sixty degrees north latitude shows features sixty five kilometers forty miles in diameter measurements in images such as this one indicate that saturn has fewer east to west wind currents than does jupiter illustration eleven twelve eighty four hundred and forty two thousand kilometers two hundred and sixty five thousand miles numerous small cloud features were photographed as voyager one passed above saturn's southern hemisphere at these polar latitudes the large-scale light and dark bands break down into small-scale features seen here as waves and eddies illustration eleven seven eighty seven point five million kilometers four point six million miles two brown ovals approximately ten thousand kilometers six thousand miles across were discovered in saturn's northern hemisphere at about forty degrees and sixty degrees latitude the polar oval upper left has a structure similar to saturn's red oval located in the southern polar latitudes detail within the ovals is not visible at this resolution so it is not yet known if they are rotating features similar to the many spots in jupiter's atmosphere the rings illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred and seventeen thousand kilometers four hundred and forty four thousand miles the rings of saturn have amazed and intrigued astronomers for over three hundred years now that we have seen them up close they are even more astonishing although they stretch over sixty five thousand kilometers forty thousand miles they may be only a few kilometers thick the ring particles from a few microns to a meter three feet in size have been described as icy snowballs or ice-covered rock voyager scientists continue to pore over their data searching for answers to the puzzles of the rings 
the rings were named in order of their discovery so the labels do not indicate their relative positions from the planet outward they are known as d c b a f and e illustration ten twenty five a twenty four million kilometers fifteen million miles extraordinarily complex structure is seen across the entire span of saturn's ring system the sequence taken approximately every fifteen minutes as voyager one approached saturn proceeds from top to bottom in each column and shows radial spokes rotating within the b-ring the spokes may be caused by a combination of magnetic and electrostatic forces illustration eleven six eighty eight million kilometers five million miles over ninety-five individual concentric features can be counted the final count in higher resolution images may be anywhere from five hundred to one thousand separate rings a few of the ringlets shown in this computer assembled mosaic are not concentric circles but are instead elliptical ring particles are probably ice or ice covered rock illustration the classic features of the rings are illustrated in the diagram d ring c ring b ring spoke cassini division ink division a ring f ring illustration eleven eight eighty six million kilometers three point seven million miles the cassini division is filled with numerous ringlets discovered by cassini in 1675 this area between the a and b rings had long been thought devoid of material the voyager observation of well-defined rings within the cassini division was an unexpected discovery illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred forty thousand kilometers four hundred and sixty thousand miles saturn's ring system viewed from below appears dramatically different from its appearance on the sunlit side this computer processed image shows the f ring circling outside the a ring the a ring with its anchored division the multiple ringlets in the cassini division and the optically thick b ring seen here in magenta hues the coloration is an artifact of processing and is not real the b-ring appears dark from below the ring plane because it is dense enough to reflect most of the sunlight causing it to appear very bright when seen from the sunward side the opaline brightness of the cassini division here indicates a great deal of sunlight being scattered through this region the ink division may really be empty since it appears dark from both above and below illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred and twenty thousand kilometers four hundred and fifty thousand miles outbound and above the ring plane voyager one gave us this view of saturn's rings eight hours after its closest approach to the planet the unique lighting accentuates the many hundreds of bright and dark ringlets comprising the ring system the c ring dark gray area seems to blend into the brighter b ring as the concentric features radiate out from the planet the dark spoke-like features seen in images taken during the approach to saturn now appear as bright streaks indicating that they may be composed of small particles illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred and fifty thousand kilometers four hundred and seventy thousand miles two narrow braided rings in the f ring are evident in this view as well as a broader very diffuse component about thirty five kilometers twenty miles across a totally unexpected discovery the braided rings trace distinctly separate orbits intertwining each other the knots may be local clumps of ring material or tiny moons it is difficult to explain this complicated structure using only the gravitational forces known to be affecting the particles of this ring it is possible that additional electrostatic forces may also influence these particles illustration eleven eight eighty seven million kilometers 
four point three million miles brightness variations in the f-ring may be due to clumping in the ring material the features are seen at the top and again near the left edge of the ring in this image the gap in the ring left center is not real but is the location of a resume mark on the camera's vidicon tube these bright features in the f-ring appear to move at the orbital rate of the ring particles and may be larger bodies or thicknesses in the rings saturn's thirteenth and fourteenth satellites which orbit on either side of the f-ring may act like sheepdogs herding the f-ring particles between them less than one hundred kilometers sixty miles wide the f-ring is located outside of the a-ring satellite fourteen discovered by voyager one is seen just inside the f-ring the satellites in only twelve hours saturn's satellites grew from names in ancient mythology into dazzling worlds with personae of their own as voyager one sailed through the saturn system it returned photographs of mimas enceladus tethys dion and rhea all part of a class of intermediate-sized icy bodies heretofore unstudied by planetary spacecraft all but enceladus show heavily cratered surfaces evidence of eons of meteorite bombardment enceladus hints at internal processes as yet unidentified which may have erased from its surface the evidence of early bombardment but we must await voyager two's arrival next august to better understand this body illustration eleven nine eighty four point five million kilometers two point eight million miles the surface of giant titan now dethroned from its seat as the solar system's largest satellite jupiter's ganymede is larger remains an enigma shrouded beneath thick layers of haze illustration eleven twelve eighty twenty two thousand kilometers fourteen thousand miles tiny moons three new ones and three confirmed from previous sightings may tell us much about ring dynamics since gravitational forces from satellites probably influence the ring structure two of these tiny moons are on the verge of collision in the same orbit while several others appear to bound the a and f rings iapetus whose two hemispheres differ dramatically in brightness was photographed in its orbit almost three point six million kilometers two point two million miles from the planet illustration eleven twelve eighty four hundred and twenty five thousand kilometers two hundred and sixty four thousand miles mimas saturn's innermost large satellite has an impact crater covering more than one quarter the diameter of the entire moon nowhere else in the solar system has such a disproportionately large feature been seen in fact it is believed that any impact larger than this would probably have shattered mamus into two or more fragments the crater has a raised rim and central peak typical of large impact structures on terrestrial planets additional smaller craters fifteen to forty five kilometers ten to thirty miles in diameter can be seen scattered across the surface particularly along the terminator mamus is one of the small low-density saturnian satellites implying that it is composed primarily of ice illustration eleven twelve eighty one hundred thirty thousand kilometers eighty thousand miles mamus's other side shows a uniformly and heavily cratered surface a record of the bombardment that occurred throughout the solar system in its early history four point five billion years ago a long narrow trough about five kilometers three miles wide crosses from northeast to southwest mimas's surface is very reflective about sixty per cent indicating that it consists largely of ice which has been chipped and pulverized by eons of meteoritic bombardment such a surface on a small low-mass moon would probably resemble light powdery snow 
features as small as three kilometers two miles across are visible illustration eleven twelve eighty six hundred and fifty thousand kilometers four hundred thousand miles enceladus appears to be largely devoid of craters or other major surface relief suggesting that perhaps internal processes may have erased such structures this satellite will be seen better by voyager two when it flies past saturn in august nineteen eighty one illustration eleven twelve eighty one point two million kilometers seven hundred and fifty thousand miles this heavily cratered surface of tethys faces toward saturn and includes a large valley about seven hundred and fifty kilometers five hundred miles long and sixty kilometers forty miles wide the craters are the result of impacts and the valley appears to be a large fracture of unknown origin tethys has a diameter of one thousand and fifty kilometers six hundred and fifty miles about one-third that of earth's moon the smallest features visible in this picture are about twenty four kilometers fifteen miles across illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred thousand kilometers four hundred and thirty five thousand miles dion reveals two distinctly different hemispheres the photograph shows dion's trailing side bright radiating patterns are probably rays of debris thrown out of impact craters other bright areas may be topographic ridges and valleys illustration eleven twelve eighty a hundred and sixty two thousand kilometers one hundred and one thousand miles dion's other hemisphere mosaic also has many impact craters the record of cosmic collisions the largest crater is less than one hundred kilometers sixty miles in diameter and includes a well-developed central peak sinuous valleys seen near each pole are probably the result of crustal fracturing in the moon's icy crust dion's diameter is only eleven hundred kilometers seven hundred miles much smaller than any of jupiter's icy moons illustration eleven thirteen eighty eighty thousand kilometers fifty thousand miles craters stand shoulder to shoulder on the surface of saturn's satellite rhea seen in this mosaic of the highest resolution pictures of the north polar region rhea is fifteen hundred kilometers nine hundred and fifty miles in diameter and is the most heavily cratered saturn moon the largest crater made by the impact of cosmic debris is about three hundred kilometers a hundred and ninety miles in diameter illustration eleven twelve eighty a hundred and twenty eight thousand kilometers seventy nine thousand five hundred miles impact craters on the ancient surface of rhea closely resemble those on mercury and earth's moon many of the craters have central peaks formed by rebound of the floor during the explosive formation of the crater some craters are old and degraded by later impacts many have sharp rims and appear relatively fresh while others are very shallow and have subdued rims indicative of their antiquity white areas on the edges of several of the craters are probably fresh ice exposed on steep slopes or possibly deposited by volatiles leaking from fractured regions surface features as small as two point five kilometers one point five miles in diameter are visible illustration eleven nine eighty four point five million kilometers two point eight million miles titan is a large bizarre satellite it is larger almost five thousand a hundred and twenty kilometers or three thousand one hundred and eighty miles in diameter than the planet mercury and possesses a dense atmosphere of unique composition voyager one's cameras show titan's surface to be totally obscured by a thick layer of atmospheric haze in the full disk photograph only two features are visible a faint boundary between the southern and darker northern hemispheres and a dark hood overlying titan's north polar region illustration eleven twelve eighty four hundred and thirty five thousand kilometers 
two hundred seventy thousand miles this hood and greater detail in the haze layers are shown in a higher resolution photograph illustration eleven ten eighty four point six million kilometers two point eight million miles little detail can be seen in this distant view of hyperion the satellite which orbits just beyond titan voyager two will observe hyperion at a closer range illustration eleven twelve eighty three point two million kilometers one point nine million miles saturn's satellite iapetus displays a large circular feature about two hundred kilometers a hundred twenty miles across with a dark spot in its center the circular feature is probably a large impact structure outlined by dark material possibly thrown out by the impact the satellite's leading hemisphere is to the left and the trailing hemisphere which is four to five times brighter is to the right iapetus diameter is one thousand four hundred fifty kilometers nine hundred miles illustration eleven twelve eighty a hundred and seventy seven thousand kilometers one hundred and ten thousand miles two satellites saturn's tenth and eleventh revolve in nearly identical orbits a hundred and fifty one thousand kilometers ninety four thousand miles from saturn's center the satellites are each one hundred to two hundred kilometers in diameter larger than the distance separating their orbits and they are currently approaching one another at a rate which promises collision in about two years such a collision however will probably be averted by orbital changes induced by the satellite's mutual gravitational interactions as they near one another the trailing co-orbital satellite seen in this photograph has a very irregular outline the sun is shining from the left this color composite was produced from three exposures taken over a period of more than six minutes during this period a thin shadow cast by a previously unknown ring moved across the satellite causing the rainbow pattern shown here illustration ten twenty five eighty twenty five million kilometers sixteen million miles two smaller satellites saturn's thirteenth and fourteenth moons were discovered on october twenty fifth nineteen eighty in images taken to study the dark spokes within saturn's b ring the smaller inner satellite has a diameter of about five hundred kilometers three hundred miles and is visible just outside the a ring near the bottom of the picture it travels in an orbit between the a ring and the f ring not visible in this photograph the second satellite seen to the left travels just outside the f ring and is about six hundred kilometers four hundred miles in diameter scientists believe the dimensions of the narrow f ring may be determined by these two satellites which orbit on either edge of the ring a glimpse back illustration eleven thirteen eighty one point five million kilometers nine hundred thirty thousand miles looking back at the saturn system as it soared upward and outward voyager one continued its observations for nearly five weeks after closest saturn approach the spacecraft photographed the planet's sunlit crescent the ring shadows falling on the planet and saturn's dark hemisphere illuminated by ring shine it searched for lightning and auroras on the planet's dark side and looked for sun dogs resulting from ammonia crystals in the atmosphere it continued temperature and composition measurements and searched for new satellites out to the orbit of mimas it measured the flow of plasma in saturn's magnetosphere and now its journey far from over voyager one proceeds toward the outer boundary of our solar system as it seeks to probe the space among the stars of our galaxy the milky way illustration eleven sixteen eighty five point three million kilometers three point three million miles departing saturn voyager one photographed the planet from a unique perspective clearly showing saturn's shadow on the rings illustration eleven twelve eighty two hundred and fifty thousand kilometers a hundred and fifty thousand miles 
during a forty-minute period on the day of encounter the spacecraft was itself in the planet's shadow at this time the wide-angle camera acquired a photograph of the shadow line revealing ring material in a region very close to the planet where no material had been previously observed this inner ring the d ring is roughly six thousand kilometers four thousand miles wide and extends to within about six thousand kilometers of saturn's cloud tops the voyager mission only once every a hundred and seventy five years are the outer planets aligned in their orbits so that we can take advantage of gravity assist trajectories to achieve encounters with jupiter saturn uranus and neptune on one mission the gravity assist technique uses one planet's gravity field and motion through space to alter the spacecraft's flight path and propel it outward toward the next planet voyager one's trajectory which was selected to best view titan has now propelled the spacecraft out of the ecliptic plane while voyager two's path will remain in this plane to provide future encounters with uranus and possibly with neptune mission objectives the voyager project was approved in june nineteen seventy two and had as its mission objectives exploration of the jupiter and saturn planetary systems including their atmospheres rings satellites and magnetospheres comparative analyses of the two systems investigation of the interplanetary medium between earth and saturn a fourth objective added in nineteen seventy six was to preserve the possibility of extending the mission to include an investigation of the planet uranus and the interstellar medium with the completion of voyager one's saturn flyby it is now clear that these objectives will be achieved spacecraft characteristics two identical spacecraft were developed for the nineteen seventy seven launch opportunity these marvelous machines were cleverly designed to survive the rigors of long voyages in outer space and to deliver high-quality scientific information required for detailed understanding of planetary systems the spacecraft are both complex automatically responding to their earthbound monitors that remotely control them via radio commands and highly autonomous capable of caring for themselves in many areas through a system of sensors computers and spare equipment each spacecraft functions on about four hundred watts of electrical power which is provided by nuclear generators broadcasts of data across a billion miles to earth are accomplished with a spacecraft transmitter power of only about twenty five watts the amount of energy required by a small household light bulb voyager's scientific payload was carefully chosen to observe saturn over a wide range of wavelengths and to measure magnetic fields charged particles and plasma waves saturn encounter illustration voyager one approached within one hundred twenty four thousand kilometers seventy seven thousand miles of saturn's cloud tops six of the satellites that were photographed are shown in their approximate positions at closest approach by the spacecraft titan dion tethys mamos and Saladus, rhea voyager one's saturn encounter period began on august twenty second nineteen eighty at a range of one hundred and nine million kilometers sixty eight million miles from the planet even at this great distance voyager's images were better than any from earth-based telescopes during the long encounter period which extended through december nineteenth nineteen eighty continuous observations of saturn's realm were carried out by voyager's instruments voyager one's flight path through the saturn system demanded navigation of the highest precision to meet three critical targets one a close four thousand kilometer two thousand three hundred mile flyby and occultation at titan two a precise three-minute time period when the spacecraft was emerging from occultation 
at the same time earth was in a position to receive the spacecraft signals passing through the gap between saturn and its rings and three a flight path through the e-ring at theon's orbit to assure safe passage through a zone clear of potentially dangerous material to assure these targets were achieved small trajectory trim maneuvers were executed on october eleventh nineteen eighty and again on november sixth nineteen eighty as voyager one sped toward saturn illustration voyager spacecraft and scientific instruments high gain antenna three point seven meter diameter low energy charged particle cosmic ray plasma imaging ultraviolet spectrometer infrared interferometer spectrometer photopolarimeter optical calibration target planetary radio astronomy and plasma wave antenna two radio isotope thermoelectric generator three magnetometer boom by october twenty fourth nineteen eighty when voyager one was about thirty million kilometers ninety million miles from saturn the spacecraft's narrow angle camera could no longer capture the planet in a single picture thus a period of multiple images or mosaics began by november second nineteen eighty even four picture mosaics could no longer cover the rapidly growing scene voyager one's pace of operations reached an exciting peak during the near encounter phase from november eleventh through november thirteenth nineteen eighty while still about one point six million kilometers one million miles from closest approach to saturn voyager one encountered titan on november eleventh nineteen eighty and then dipped below the ring plane as it accelerated rapidly toward saturn on november twelfth nineteen eighty voyager one came within one hundred twenty four thousand kilometers seventy seven thousand miles of the cloud tops of saturn's southern hemisphere where saturn's gravity altered the spacecraft's course hurtling the spacecraft upward past the ring plane close observation of saturn's other major satellites and its rings were made during this passage from earth to saturn voyager one has traveled in the ecliptic plane the plane in which the major planets orbit now having completed its final planetary flyby voyager one is rising above this plane on a trajectory that will eventually carry it above and out of the solar system probably before the end of the century as it proceeds the spacecraft will return information about the solar wind and magnetic fields in the far unexplored reaches of our solar system and will observe cosmic rays emitted from the distant stars among which voyager will ultimately cruise scientific highlights some of the most important information gathered by voyager one on the saturn system is presented pictorially in this publication and is supplemented here with brief summaries of the major discoveries observations and theories saturn saturn's atmosphere appears similar to jupiter's with alternating dark belts and bright zones circulating storm regions and other dark and light cloud markings saturn's belt and zone system extends to higher latitudes than those on jupiter and all of the features are muted by a thick atmospheric haze perhaps seventy kilometers forty miles deep wind speeds up to fifteen hundred kilometers per hour nine hundred miles per hour occur at the equator four to five times faster than any jovian winds temperatures near the cloud tops range from eighty six to ninety two kelvins minus three hundred and five degrees to minus two hundred and ninety four degrees fahrenheit nearly sixty degrees colder than at jupiter saturn still radiates about two point eight times as much heat as it receives from the sun the coolest temperatures are found at the center of the equatorial zone auroral emissions have been seen near saturn's poles and 
Auroral type emissions have been seen in ultraviolet light near the illuminated limb of the planet. Lightning bolts have not been seen on Saturn, but radio emissions typical of lightning discharges have been recorded. The source of these discharges is believed to be the rings rather than Saturn's atmosphere. Rings Hundreds of tiny ringlets, a few of them elliptical rather than circular, comprise the classic A, B, and C rings, once thought to be uniform disks of material. The F ring, which was first sighted by Pioneer 11 in 1979, was observed to be three separate intertwined ringlets. The existence of a D ring between the C ring and the planet has been confirmed by observations during Voyager 1's passage through Saturn's shadow. The tenuous E-ring, previously observed from Earth only when Saturn's rings could be viewed edge-on every 15 years, has also been observed during shadowed passage. At least one other ring has been found between the E and F rings in Voyager images. Long radial spoke-like features in the B-ring were dark when viewed upon approach and bright when observed after encounter when the spacecraft looked back toward the planet and the sun new satellites voyager one photographed six tiny moons some that had never been seen before satellites ten and eleven dubbed the co-orbitals share an orbit ninety one thousand kilometers fifty seven thousand miles above saturn's cloud tops the leading satellite has a diameter of about 160 kilometers, 100 miles, while the trailing satellite has an irregular shape, approximately 105 by 65 kilometers, 65 by 40 miles. Little is known about satellites 12, 13, 14, and 15, aside from their orbits and periods. Satellite 12 orbits at the same distance from saturn as dion at a point about sixty degrees ahead of dion satellites thirteen and fourteen outside and inside the f ring respectively appear to herd this thin ring between them satellite fifteen appears to limit the outer edge of the a ring in a similar manner inner satellites mimos enceladus tethys dion and rhea represent a body size not previously explored by spacecraft they are larger than jupiter's amalthea and mars's phobos and deimos yet smaller than mercury our moon or jupiter's large satellites their diameters range from three hundred and ninety kilometers two hundred and forty miles for mimos to fifteen hundred thirty kilometers nine hundred and fifty miles for rhea and they are probably composed primarily of water ice with the exception of enceladus all of these moons have heavily cratered surfaces looking much like the moon and mercury mimas displays an impact crater whose diameter is one-fourth that of the satellite such an impact must have nearly shattered the icy satellite tethys has a valley seventy kilometers forty miles wide that stretches 800 kilometers, 500 miles, across the satellite, an apparent crustal fracture resulting from seismic activity. Several sinuous valleys, some of which appear to branch, are visible on Dion's surface. Both Dion and Rhea have bright, wispy streaks on their already highly reflective surfaces, perhaps caused by ice thrown out of craters by meteorite impacts of the five inner moons enceladus appears the smoothest but we will have to wait for voyager two to photograph the satellite at greater resolution in nineteen eighty one since the maximum intensity of the e-ring occurs near enceladus's orbit enceladus may be a source of e-ring particles titan titan is now known to be smaller than jupiter's ganymede its diameter is less than fifty one hundred twenty kilometers 3180 miles which implies a density twice that of water ice a dense hazy atmosphere at least 400 kilometers 250 miles thick obscures the surface 
voyager one determined that titan has a nitrogen rich atmosphere as does earth but with concentrations of hydrocarbons such as methane natural gas ethane acetylene ethylene and deadly hydrogen cyanide the haze layers merge into a darkened hood over the north pole at the poles liquid nitrogen lakes may form the surface temperature is probably near one hundred kelvins minus two hundred and eighty degrees fahrenheit only slightly warmer than the boiling point of liquid nitrogen titan has no appreciable magnetic field and therefore possesses no large liquid conducting core it does however supply a small amount of charged particles to saturn's magnetosphere the southern hemisphere is somewhat brighter than the northern perhaps as a result of seasonal effects outer satellites of the three known outer satellites voyager one studied from a distance only hyperion and iapetus tiny phoebe in its retrograde clockwise orbit will be studied by voyager two in the summer of nineteen eighty one hyperion and iapetus are most likely composed of water ice although their masses and densities are uncertain iapetus has one bright and one dark hemisphere the dark side which faces forward as iapetus circles saturn reflects about one-fifth as much light as the trailing bright side magnetosphere although it is only about one-third the size of jupiter's magnetosphere saturn's magnetosphere is still an enormous structure extending nearly two million kilometers from the planet toward the sun the size of the magnetosphere fluctuates rhythmically as the flow of charged particles in the solar wind increases or decreases in intensity the magnetosphere can be pushed inside titan's orbit so that at times the satellite finds itself outside of the magnetosphere altogether charged particles in the planet's magnetosphere are dragged along by the magnetic field circling the planet at saturn's rotation rate of ten hours thirty nine minutes these charged particles whiz by titan at a dizzying rate of more than two hundred kilometers a hundred and twenty miles per second titan leaves a motorboat like wake in its orbital path extending from the orbit of titan inward to the orbit of rhea an enormous cloud of uncharged hydrogen atoms forms a donut-shaped torus of ultraviolet emitting particles because of their neutrality these atoms are not towed around by saturn's magnetic field close to the planet saturn's rings act as an effective shield or absorber of charged particles the rings themselves are apparently substantially affected in this process however as evidenced by their spokes of fine particles and the lightning-like electrical discharges attributed to the rings our voyager knew marvelously the laws of gravitation and all attractive and repulsive forces he used them in such a timely way that once with the help of a ray of sunshine another time thanks to a cooperative comet he went from globe to globe he and his kin as a bird flutters from branch to branch voltaire micromegas histoire philosophique seventeen fifty two national aeronautics and space administration jet propulsion laboratory california institute of technology pasadena california j p l four hundred dash one hundred twelve slash eighty end of voyager one encounters saturn by national aeronautics and space administration waterfront fancies by ben hacked from a thousand and one afternoons in chicago this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by matt perard man's capacity for faith is infinite he is able to believe with passion in things invisible 
he can achieve a fantastic confidence in the unknowable here he sits on the breakwater near the municipal pier a fish-pole in his hand staring patiently into the agate-coloured water he can see nothing the lake is enormous it contains thousands of square miles of water and yet this man is possessed of an unshakable faith that by some mysterious ledgermain of chance a fish with ten thousand square miles of water to swim in safely will seek out the little minnow less than an inch in length which he has lowered beside the breakwater and so the victim of the preposterous conviction he sits and eyes the tip of his fish-pole with unflagging hope it is warm the sun spreads a brightly coloured but uncomfortable woollen blanket over their heads a tepid breeze reminiscent of cinders whirl idly over the warm cement strung along the pier are a hundred figures all in identical postures they set in defiance of all logic all mathematics for it is easy to calculate that if there are a half million fish in lake michigan and each fish displaces less than five cubic inches of water there would be only two and a half million cubic inches of fish altogether lost in an expanse containing at least eight hundred billion cubic inches of water therefore the chance of one fish being at any one particular spot are one in four hundred thousand in other words the odds against each of these strangely patient men watching the ends of their fish poles the odds against their catching a fish are four hundred thousand to one it is therefore somewhat amazing to stand and watch what happens along the sunny breakwater every three minutes one of the poles jerks out of the water with a wriggling prize on the hook how are they coming we ask oh so-so answers one of the fishermen and points mutely to a string of several dozen perch floating under his feet in the water thus does man by virtue of his faith rise above the science of mathematics and the barriers of logic thus in his fantastic belief in things unseen and easily disproved vindicated he catches fish whereby the law of probabilities there should be no fish with a whole lake stretching mockingly before him he sits consumed with a preposterous a fanatical faith in the little half-inch minnow dangling at the end of his line the hours pass the sun grows hotter the piles of stone and steel along the lake front seem to waver from the distant streets come faint noises on a hot day the city is as appealing as a half-cooled cinder patch poor devils in factories poor devils in stores in offices one must sigh thinking of them life is even vaster than the lake in which these fishermen fish and happiness is mathematically elusive as the fish for which the fishermen wait and yet an old man with a battered face a young man with a battered face silent stoical battered-looking men with fish poles a hundred two hundred they sit staring into the water of the lake as if they were looking for something for fish incredible one does not sit like this watching for something to become visible why because then there would be an air of suspense about the watcher he would grow nervous after an hour when the thing remained still invisible and finally he would fall into hysterics and unquestionably shriek and these men grow calmer then what are they looking at hour after hour under the hot sun nothing they are letting the rhythm of water and sky lull them into a sleep a surcease from living this is a very poetical thing for a hundred battered-looking men to attempt yet life may be as intimidating to honest unimaginative ones as to their self-styled superiors there are many types fishing but all of them look soiled idlers workers unhappy ones they come to forget to let the agate eye of the lake stare them into a few hours of oblivion but there is something else long ago men hunted and fished to keep alive they fought with animals and sat with empty stomachs staring at the water not in quest of nirvanas but of fish so now after ages and ages have passed there is left a vague memory of this in the minds of these fishermen this memory makes them still feel a certain thrill in the business of pursuit even as they sit stoical and inanimate 
forgetful of unpaid bills unfinished and never to be finished plans there comes this curious thrill a mouth tugs at the little minnow the pole jerks electrically in the hand something alive is on the hook and the fisherman for an instant recovers his past he is ab fighting with an evening meal off the coast of wales two glacial periods ago his body quivers his muscles set his eyes flash zip the line leaps out of the water another monster of the deep whose conquest is necessary for the survival of the race of man has been overcome there he hangs writhing on a hook there he swings toward his triumphant foe and the hand of the fisherman on the municipal breakwater trembling with mysterious elation closes about the wet firm body of an outraged perch a make-believe hunt that now bears the name of sport yes but not always here is one with a red battered face and a curiously practical air about him he is putting his fish in a basket and counting them two dozen perch want to sell them he shakes his head what are you going to do with them he looks up and grins slowly then he points to his lips with his fingers and makes signs this means he is dumb he places his hand over his stomach and grins again he is going to eat them it is time to go home and do this so he puts up his fish pole and packs his primitive paraphernalia a tin can a rusty spike a bamboo pole here is one then who in the heart of the still forest called civilization still seeks out long-forgotten ways of keeping life in his body he hunts for fish the sun slides down the sky the fishermen begin to pack up they walk with their heads down and bent forward like number sevens they raise their eyes occasionally to the piles of stone and steel that mark the city front back to their troubles and their cinder patch but and this is a curious fact their eyes gleam with hope and curiosity End of Waterfront Fancies by Ben Hatt